My name is Geoffrey Miller, and I'm a trustee of the Friends of St. Cuthbert's. Our aim is to secure the presence of our church in the city of Edinburgh. Members receive our church magazine and out with pandemics meet with others at organized outings. If you enjoy viewing our series of talks or have ideas about further subjects or speakers, why not join the society? Details are available on the church website. When I was a student, a medical student in the 1950s, I learned that the International Grenfell Association engaged students to work with their doctors in Newfoundland and Labrador, as well as they took school pupils to help in building projects and nurseries in the summer months. They arranged transport, accommodation, and food for their volunteers. So I applied and succeeded in getting a place. Accordingly, I presented myself at the dockside in Middlesbrough to board the ore carrier Dun Craig, which would carry me to Wabana, Newfoundland. Wilfred Grenfell was born in 1885 in Cheshire. His father was a schoolmaster, and after leaving school, he went to London to study medicine. When he qualified, he had a strong urge to work among disadvantaged people. Inspired by the evangelist D.L. Moody, and he joined the Royal National Mission to Deep Sea Fishermen, which resulted in him traveling to Newfoundland and Labrador in Eastern Canada. He left the Deep Sea Fishermen and established his own organization, the Grenfell Mission, combining a Christian mission with the provision of health and welfare and education amongst the very poor inhabitants. He earned money for the mission, writing books and holding public meetings. Labrador lies at the same latitude as Scotland, but under the influence of the cold Labrador current sweeping from the north. The name Labrador is the name of its first discoverer in 1498 the Portuguese explorer Lavrador. The breed of dog is named Labrador as a shortened version of Newfoundland water dog, and this avoids confusion with the large, long-haired and often black Newfoundland dog. Grenfell found three groups of inhabitants struggling to survive amid great difficulties. The largest group were white settlers originating from the southwest of England, from Ireland and Scotland, who lived on the coast catching fish, mainly cod, which they salted and sold for consumption in Russia, Germany and the Low Countries. The next group in number were the Inuit natives, who also fished and used seal skins to make small clothes which they sold to the Hudson Bay Company agents and earned small amounts of money. The third group were also native to the area, being Innu, who lived by trapping bears, caribou and porcupine, and again selling their skins and wares. Polar bears were rare in the summer months but present in the winter. All were living in poverty, in small settlements, in huts or tents, and suffered from malnutrition, scurvy, beriberi, rickets, tuberculosis, and other infections. The climate was subarctic or arctic. Their only other support came from the missions of the Moravian Church and the Roman Catholic Church. 
Although Newfoundland was the first colony of Great Britain to be founded in 1809, it remained separate from the Dominion of Canada until 1949. Men from Newfoundland served in the Great War with heavy casualties and again in 1941 when it provided a major air base at Goose Bay serving to defend transatlantic convoys and refueling aircraft crossing to Europe. The Grenfell Mission later became the International Grenfell Association and concentrated on the health and education aspects, leaving the evangelical mission to other organizations. It took on volunteers, mainly school leavers, boys who worked as laborers in the building projects, and girls who assisted in the care of children in school or patients in hospital, as well as a medical student during the summer months. My passage was arranged aboard a bulk carrier ship from Middlesbrough, going to load iron ore at Wabana in Newfoundland, a mine which operated between 1895 and 1966. There were three of us taken on as supernumerary crew, one being another medic and one a forestry student, and we were assigned comfortable cabins for the journey, which took about a week. On arrival, we traveled by taxi to St. John's, which is not very far, the capital of Newfoundland, and stayed overnight before embarking the next day on a coastal steamer, the steamship Kyle, which was my conveyance to Labrador. It was crowded and smoky from coal fuel but after four days stopping at several villages, we arrived at Happy Valley, adjacent to Goose Bay in Labrador. And I was then collected by car and ferried across the river to the Grenfell Hospital at a place called Northwest River. My task was to travel by boat northwards with a doctor to follow up patients with pulmonary tuberculosis in their villages. The hospital ship, the Marival, in service between 1926 and the 1960s, was a wooden schooner equipped with X-ray facilities. And my duty was to take X-rays and process them so that the doctor could compare the patient's condition with previous examinations and advise on treatment. The antibiotic streptomycin in combination with other drugs had been in use for a number of years and we were monitoring the patient's progress. Our doctors were two in number. Uh, the head doctor was Tony Padden, director of the Grenfell Association at the time, and a lady Mary O'Sullivan. The others aboard were the captain, called Small, the first mate, Mr. Shepherd, a cook, two engineers, and one uh, student volunteer named Alden for the first part of the journey. We visited several small settlements for consultations with patients who had been lined up either by their Moravian missionary or Catholic priest, and most had a chest x-ray for comparison with their previous examination. Modern equipment being much more compact would have made the job more efficient compared to the method which we used at the time with the large photographic films. To appreciate the distances involved, I have to tell you that the land area of Labrador is greater than that of the United Kingdom. The story is told about a visitor to St. John's, Newfoundland, traveling from London. A well-meaning colleague in Winnipeg was contacted, asking if he could meet the visitor to welcome him to Canada. The brusque reply was, meet him yourself, you live nearer. Our most northern call 
was at a place called Hebron, about a hundred, about a thousand kilometers from Northwest River. There were 58 families there, and at the time of our visit, plans were being made to evacuate the settlement, but this was not revealed for some months. When implemented six months later, they were resented by the settlers and the resettlement was a failure. However, Hebron remains abandoned and we were probably the last visitors there. The larger settlements were served by nursing stations, which had two or three beds for patients. Those needing more attention had to be transferred to hospital at Northwest River or to hospital in St. Anthony in Newfoundland. And if more specialized care was required to St. John's in Newfoundland. Transport was very difficult in the absence of roads uh, and was mainly in the summer by sea uh, but prevented uh, in the autumn and spring by freezing coastal waters. Sledges drawn by dog teams can operate in the winter but are very dependent on water, on weather and a firm base of frozen sea water. Air transport was introduced late in the 1940s based on single-ended de Havilland beaver and otter planes, which could land on floats or skis. Communication was very difficult with no telephone system and an erratic radio contact due to the distances and frequent bad weather. A modern health service does not come cheap and there are particular difficulties in Labrador with barely any roads and small population centers widely spaced, being sited where the fishing population had made its harbors and the Moravian and Roman Catholic missions followed them. Our boat named Maraval was subsequently sold and converted to carry freight and finally fuel petrol. Tragically, after it had been sold, it caught fire and was destroyed in 1978 while in dock with the loss of two lives. We set off and with our engine, traveled northwards. One evening when we were at anchor, Dr. Padden decided that the crew should learn how to catch cod to supplement our diet. The traditional method of fishing on the Grand Banks of Newfoundland was with a hand line from a boat, a dory, or as in our case, a schooner. The hand line was wound on a frame and tied to it was the jigger, consisting of a lead weight in the shape of a fish some 15 centimeters long with a tail fashioned as a metal hook. The technique was to lower the jigger over the side of the boat, lower it until it struck the sea bottom and then raise it by about a meter. There must have been a shoal of fish waiting to be caught because you could feel them bumping on the hook. And when you felt contact, you hauled the line in and there would be a cod caught on the hook, often foul hooked, unfortunately. The method may now be illegal, but once in a shoal, the process could be repeated by two or three fishers from the same boat until you thought you had caught enough. When you Then you filleted the fish and hung it on the ship's rigging to dry in the sun. When dry, you could pick off a segment of dried fish, separate it from the inner surface of the skin, and after considerable chewing, swallow. One important aspect of life for a 23 year old is food. And surprisingly, there is no mention of this in my letters. I remember there was a barrel of salt water on the deck, which contained various cuts of meat. 
and once when we encountered another boat engaged on scientific research, which was more fully equipped than ours, we were able to obtain frozen meat, which improved our meals considerably. Our cook had a wood burning stove, which he lit in the morning before he came to wake us up. One morning, my companion asked the cook to delay cooking breakfast until he appeared himself in the dining room as he liked his fried egg to be fresh. The cook's reply was that he was too late as the eggs were fried the night before while the stove was still hot. Our journey to the Northwest River was delayed by bad weather, wind, fog and rain, and it was the worst summer that people could remember. On a clear night, however, the display of Aurora Borealis, the northern lights, could be very spectacular. By early September, we were back in Northwest River at the end of my stay. I traveled back to St. John's by air from Goose Bay to Gander, and then joined another iron ore carrier uh, crossing the North Atlantic to see Scotland again at the Pentland Firth, finally returning to Middlesbrough. It was certainly a unique experience which showed me a different side of medical life as well as a change of culture and environment. Thank you for your attention. The 87 mile stretch of water, which runs from Northwest River in a northeasterly direction to the Atlantic Ocean is called Lake Melville after the Edinburgh lawyer, Henry Dundas, the first Viscount Melville, a colleague of William Pitt, whose statue stands to this day in St. Andrew's Square. 